1997, it was 96, 97, we were working on Starship Troopers, Dante's Peak, Spawn, you know, films like that. And I, out of the blue, I get a call from, uh, from Jim. I get a text page while I'm on, on location or on the set for Spawn, which I was not having a good time on. <laughs> and he said, come down to Mexico and be in the movie. I was, you know, odd that he even remembered and thought of me. Uh, I, 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 I joke that he that I may have been the only Asian person he knew of that age that might Wait, were you a DEI role, but... hire? <laughs> then? Apparently, apparently. So uh, I, I took a week off. Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Actors, historians, authors, descendants and fans come here to talk about Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. It is unbelievable to us that we are this far in season two of Titanic Talk that we could be wrapping up the season, but we're going to go out with a bang. Uh, here I am with my talented and lovely co-host, Alexandra Boyd, the filmmaker behind Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries, and we have a very special guest connected to uh, the Titanic film, which made uh, Alexandra have her initial interest in the Ship of Dreams. On that note, Alexandra, will you do the introductions? I will. I will. I'm very excited about this guest because not only is he um, a very, very strongly connected to James Cameron and his work and his legacy and going back in time, he's been part of one of my favorite James Cameron movies, which is controversial because it's not Titanic. And he's <laughs> an actor because everybody listening to this will know who Van Ling is. He is the Chinese man who is featured quite, you know, to those eagle eyes who've watched the film so many times. They all watched all of the deleted scenes, which thank God I'm in a few of those. Van Ling, welcome to Titanic Talk. Yay. We're so excited to be able to chat to you and delve a little deeper into the VFX, which is really your world. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. Well, well, it's fantastic. And what what I would like to do um, uh, to to filmmakers listening or people who really want to get into film and and do the kind of work that you do, they might not feel they're they're actors or writers or directors, but there are so many jobs that make up a a film production at, without which there would be no film. And your department certainly rings true in that. What, first of all, back in the 80s drew you to... <laughs> well, I'm thinking like it can't be the 70s because we didn't have digital film. It was all, it was all 24 <laughs> frames a second and, it, you know, on celluloid. What, what, what drew you to this medium and how did you get started? Well... Um, the 70s really got me started. Star Wars was obviously a, a pivotal film in my life. Uh, I was 13 when Star Wars came out. Huge, huge uh, thing, of course. And it, it revolutionized movies in the way that in 75, Jaws kind of was the first quote unquote summer blockbuster and populist movie. Um, and uh, at, at that time, that was of its type, um, you know, breaking all sorts of records. It was the first, it was, you know, the first film, by, I think, $100 million, uh, which is hilarious to think about it today, uh, mm -hmm. given inflation and just the, the, you know, the way the media has changed. Um, and uh, Star Wars was a huge thing for me. And one of the other seminal things, going through high school and then, I graduated in 82, the year there were a ridiculous number of uh, big kind of science fiction genre films that came out. That was, that was a huge thing. Um, that, was the, that was the summer that Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, Tron, Road Warrior, 
um, Conan the Barbarian. Mommy dearest. And, and it's, uh, it's See, Mommy dearest, those eyebrows, they must have been a lot to work on. <laughs> well, there, there is this, there is this really, really big boom of, of stuff that was right up my alley. And so it was, it was really fantastic to, uh, oh, an ET and poltergeist. So were you an artist? Genres, were you an artist? Were you drawing? Were you, were you sketching? I was, a, I was a student of filmmaking and I went to USC film school after I graduated in 82. I was fortunate enough to get into the film school uh, here in Los Angeles and uh did my four-year undergrad there and uh during that process in 1984 there was a class and there was this class every semester where uh it's called thursday night the movies and what it really is is that one of the faculty members would bring in a film that was currently just releasing or about to be released and he would bring in the filmmakers uh to talk about it and what a fantastic opportunity and yeah. one of the reasons why yeah. you want to go to usc you know <laughs> with no matter how great a school is uh the, the the proximity of usc lends itself to that incredibly uh so so who were some of your thursday night specials oh we had all sorts of people um you know from oh gosh i'm trying to remember all the folks but uh obviously the most important one that happened to me was this unknown independent filmmaker who came in with a with a little movie called the terminator and <laughs> and it was it was a revelation you know it had emotional depth but it was also full of action and it was gritty and uncompromising but at the same time it had a lot of heart so it was very and it was it had a lot of effects in it and makeup effects and it had and it was a it was a quote unquote low budget film at the time uh Amazing. considered and and a lot of people, you know, look at this kind of film even in those days as, oh, well, it's it's kind of schlocky because it's not the high glossy visual effects films that, you know, ILM does or anything like that. But it was this gritty film that really struck a chord. That was in October, I believe, of 1984. And I remember this this young bearded guy coming out, you know, talking about the film. And what struck me about him was he wasn't just, you know, talking about the movie. He was talking about practical things that students might be interested in. Oh, well, the little Mexican boy at the end of the film, we had three different boys playing that kid because we had to shoot with the actor that you see his face for, for his close-ups talking to Linda Hamilton in the Jeep. And then uh, we were a low-budget film and we realized that we needed to get the reverses on her. He wasn't available anymore. And we had to shoot the reverses on her again. And so we found another kid and we only showed him from the back. And then um, we had to, we had to fake up the shirt because that was his shirt. And because we weren't able to bring him back, the, his <laughs> parents weren't going to allow him to give us the shirt. So we had to figure out and rematch the shirt. And also because the voices didn't match, we had to just dub it with a third person. And those are the kind of things that is kind of obvious today, but it was a revelation that, oh, well, yeah, you can just do this. You can just change this. And I heard even it's more that stories. Constant problem solving. That's what I always feel like on my set or the things I've learned, because I'm really a baby filmmaker, is that you 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 create this scene or this place or a location. You've got a bunch of actors there. And there's always a situation that's not quite what you anticipated. <laughs> So you sort of, you know, you you look to your crew or your producer or or an actor to come up with an idea. The best idea wins. There's always this wonderful sort of conversation. I can totally imagine how that how that went. But the, the a... T-shirt must have been a nightmare because you suddenly realize the child's not wearing the right colored T-shirt and you couldn't just color it in in those days. I yeah. Mean. Yeah. I mean, this was all what you got on camera is what you had. And um so it was really interesting to see the, the idea of just being ready to to um, to constantly improvise, to constantly kind of think about your story. What do I need to tell the story? What did I want to have and what did I not have? But what do I need? You know, can I get at least what I need and how how it you know, having it in your head to be able to say, OK, I know I can shoot the reverse this way and I can do this and we can do that tomorrow. Or, you know, I know how to do this. We can do an insert that'll sell this story point and it won't 
feel like it was, a, you know, a break in the story in some way. So Ben, I'm, I'm of, curious. I'm curious, but if, if you met Cameron initially in 1984, and then of course I did not. Meet... I did not meet Cameron in '84. I was in the audience for this. Oh, and but I saw this. I never spoke to him. He did. He did. Oh, he didn't. Okay. I thought maybe he was I mean, like I reading mean, a lecture of some sort. He was he was being a filmmaker who uh, was on the stage talking to the, the rest. Of, this isn't a small class. Yeah, this yeah. was an entire 400, 500 seat theater, you know, and did he remember the, that that um, event <laughs> when you eventually met him later uh, did, I, did... I I think he did but you know I was just a face in the crowd I didn't I didn't you know know him from Adam I didn't go up and talk to him because and I, every week I've been sitting here doing this listening to filmmakers yeah. and, and so on and talking and so um what what struck me and I remember this distinctly finishing watching the movie listening to him talk and I just said you know if I ever get a chance to work with a filmmaker a, an ex a, a real filmmaker out there it would either be him or Terry Gilliam because, you know, Brazil, uh, you know, was coming out and uh, I was a big fan of Time Bandits and, and some of the work he did because it was kind of different. It, it felt very hands on and very almost low budget, but it was also, you know, had these levels to it. So. Um, so it was, I was sure you were going to yeah, say Spielberg, exactly. considering you 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 named so many Spielberg films uh, in your list there. I thought he would be on your on your list, wish list. Well, I mean, those are a given for everybody. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in my case, in my case, uh, you know, that was halfway through my my college term. And then uh, I graduated in 1986. And that was the year that Aliens came out. And. I remember one of one of the one of the other uh, my fellow students on the project I was working on uh, was the was the son of a casting director. And so he had gotten a copy of the script. So we were pouring over and I read it and I was really impressed by it. Any any script that starts with exterior space, the stars, <laughs> the stars shining cold and remote like the love of God. That's what the first line of the script was. And so it kind of, it was this, it was really well written. It was fun. It was, it was not like esoteric, but it also wasn't pandering. And the story tones really good. I thought, this is great. I can't wait to see this movie. So I was a big fan. I was reading Starlog magazine and everything else that had anything about it. You know, opening uh, day comes out in, uh, I think it was late July. And I saw it twice that day, once in the morning, once in the <laughs> evening with some friends. And, you know, my college friends are always making fun of me for, you know, not so much for watching this kind of movie, but for being more obsessed than normal people are to about these things. And after the after the evening screening, I saw with some of my friends, one of them said to me, well, you know, you seem to be into this kind of you know effects and gadgets and stuff. You know, he's in the film school with me. And he just said, you know, I dare you to build a power loader you know, that walking machine, oh, yeah, yeah. It, the yellow walking forklift in the movie. And, uh, and I said, what, like a model? He goes, yeah, I'm having a Halloween. It's a gentleman's bet, no money, but I have a, a Halloween party coming up in a couple months or at my apartment. And, uh, you know, so that's a gentleman's bet. And I said, okay. And so, uh, I spent the next couple months because I had graduated, but I was living at my parents' house working in my parents' garage, starting to build a little power loader. But we're talking about but, special effects now and props, not VFX. You started re Remember, rem well, yeah, because visual effects in those days meant motion control and optical printers, which we generally didn't have access to. But could we build models? Could people build models? Sure. Could people, you know, do small things? Absolutely. Um, in my case, I decided to to kind of go go big, and mm -hmm. I built a seven and a half foot costume. Since it was for Halloween, I built a seven and a half foot costume with a uh, rotating light on the top, um, and uh, I motorized the claws so that they could. And I, you know, I built it so the elbows would bend and the whole thing. All I had there was no video back then. There was no. Uh, you know, ability to watch the film over and over again. All I had was photos from Starlog magazine and watching the movie. 
So how did you get through the door of the dorm? <laughs> that was that was a challenge, actually. And you're going to tell me that so, James Cameron was sitting there on the couch when you walked in? <laughs> no, no, no. Shame. But but while we're building this, a couple of friends of mine who were helping me said, "Hey, you know, you should show this to James Cameron." And I'm going, "Yeah, right. How's that going to happen?" He's, "Well, you've been calling the production offices for Gail Ann Hurd and James Cameron for all summer." because you're looking for internships, right? PA positions, whatever. I go, yeah, but you know, they never have anything, but they always said, you know, hey, you know, call back next month. So this month on Halloween 1986, <laughs> I call Gail Ann Hurt's office, Pacific Western Productions on the Fox lot. And I and asked the normal question, do you have anything? No, nothing yet, but call back. I said, and by the way, I have something interesting you might want to see, a Halloween costume. It's a power loader. The, you know, the receptionist said, what? You mean like when you wear? I said, yeah, it's Halloween, right? Dead silence. Oh, my God. Talking in the background. We got to see this. Come on down to Fox. Oh, my God. Fox lot will leave you a pass. Can I just say something that I say to young filmmakers all the time? Because you have just encapsulated exactly what what it takes to succeed and to move forward in this industry. It's a meritocracy. You have to have passion. You have to have skill, talent. Yes, all of that stuff. But outside of that, you have to have a willingness, like you're calling and calling and calling. Audacity. Like, yes, and all are going to be pissed off. If I, eventually, they'll either call you in to bring you in to stop you calling or you had this extra thing, which was this extraordinary costume. We've got to see it. Bring it, bring it, bring it in. It's that's what separates you and has built your relationship with a filmmaker like James Cameron over the decades, because everyone else is waiting for somebody to call them. You know, it's true, and there it's like passion. You either have it or you don't. So, what was the reaction when you got well, onto the Fox well, lot with well, this thing? Well, to your point, it was about being proactive. You know, nobody's going to give you anything. You have to earn it or you have to you have to do it yourself. And, you know, the tools we had back then, you know, were you know the, the barriers to get to the professional film industry are much different than they are today. You can literally post things up to the world today on YouTube and, and, and network with people in ways that you couldn't before. It was, you write letters, mm -hmm. you do phone calls, you, you, oh, you, you walk have too in many people. with the costume you, yeah. on. <laughs> well, that was the weird thing. I, you know, like a vampire, I have to be invited. So we, <laughs> so I had to rent a pickup truck. Yes, I was like, how I'm going to, logistics, thing. logistics, and, how did you get there? And, <laughs> and, you know, my friend, a couple of friends who were there with me were like, okay, let's do this. And I had to go rent a pickup truck, figure out how to, I designed it so that it would come <laughs> apart. You know, it was made out of like styrofoam and cardboard and foam core and like a wood frame. And, you know, I had a battery pack in it and the whole thing. And so I had to be able to take it apart and put it back together. And so we rented this pickup truck, drove down the freeway, pieces flying off. And to get there, there's enough of it left that we, you know, I pull into the parking lot next to their bungalow where the offices are. And they're all looking out the windows as we're putting this thing on me and uh, my friends. And I, uh, I, I finish it and I'm standing there in this and I'm twirling the arms and doing the whole thing. And Gail Ann Hurd walks out. And she says, this is the best walking resume I've ever seen. Oh, uh, wow. And which, it just which got chills. is, an, yeah, it's an, it was an amazing honor. You know, Jim was going to be there, but I was so late trying to get the truck and get there that he had to go uh. off to a meeting. So Jim wasn't there that first, uh, that first meeting, but, um, but she, she was great. And because she came from Roger Corman, she understood what I guess it meant to, to try to, you know, put something together. It doesn't matter how crazy everybody thinks you yeah. are. And so she saw something that you're hired. It was, it was a great, was the, yeah. Well, I wasn't hired. They didn't have any projects, but it was a, a moment of validation. And and then you know we talk and, and a and, relationship. And I mean, this. Is, I mean, it's an industry of relationships, and that that sealed your connection. Well, well, that, but. The, the cherry on top of it was as I was preparing to leave, because I said, I got to go back to US. I got to go to USC now. I've got to win a bet with a friend, you know, with this costume. And she said, OK, wait a minute. She goes back inside, <laughs> comes out with Sigourney Weaver's jumpsuit Stop. and custom Reeboks and says, 
you might as well make the costume complete. Just bring it back with all the same stains and dirt. Don't wash it. I was what thin enough back then that I actually fit him to Sigourney Weaver's jumpsuit. And so <laughs> now I've got the actual costume from the movie inside my Halloween costume. Amazing. True story. So then it's like, okay, pack up. I'm going to drive over to my friend's apartment. So what we did was we parked the car with the car facing with the headlights. And I was I, we put on the costume out on the street <laughs> with the car behind. So it would silhouette it just like in the movie. And one of my friends who was with me went up and told my my main friend who's having the party who made the bet that, oh, Van needs help bringing up his model. So he comes down, turns the corner and sees the silhouette of this thing from like just like the movie. So needless to say, I won the bet. Uh, <laughs> Even your mind a, was working cinematically just to just to, yes. to bring uh, it over. It's, so it's, it's, it's all about, you know, storytelling, I guess. Go up to the a party. We had to take the whole thing apart again to get into the elevator to get up to his apartment. We're sitting in the park talking and we're listening to the music on the radio and we hear an ad for a costume contest at a nightclub in Glendale. Stop. And so we were like, OK, we'll just go for it. So me and my other two friends who came with me put it back in the truck, drove to Glendale had to you know pieces again pieces flying off we had to sit there and figure out how to glue things back together but we were out in the parking lot we're trying not to reveal it until we need to so we're at the far end of the parking lot and trying to assemble it and i'm going to walk across the parking lot in this thing to get to the front door to to do this and because the pieces are flying off a friend of mine had a glue gun and he would run in to the <laughs> club bathroom plug in the glue gun till it was hot unplug it and run like hell back out to the other end of the parking lot before it cooled so we could get one or two squares of the thing long story short i won first prize which almost <laughs> paid for the cost of renting the truck and so what then great story so then i i go uh, i go on a, a a trip with my family and i as when i get back there's an answering machine message and it's jim cameron saying i hear you built a power loader worthy of note i'd like to see it he comes down in his corvette his black corvette to my parents house where he finds me working on a uh, another one of my friends who are still in school working on a set for them making foam core he was building a he was building kind of like a 2001 capsule he wanted some student filmmaking and i'm doing this jim comes in and says hey you know how to do this kind of thing and he shows me how to cut foam core because he started out at roger corman and doing foam core stuff as well so we kind of bonded there so we got to talking and he found out that I was an honor student and I was interested. I do a lot of research stuff and all sorts of things like that. I showed him the, the power loader costume and stuff. It, it wasn't to scale. It was, you know, smaller to, you know, it wasn't nine feet high. It was only seven feet high. Um, but he basically said, would you like to be my researcher? I'm starting on a new project called The Abyss. He was hadn't written it yet. He had it, he had written it as a short story in high school, but he wanted to expand it into a film. But he needed research about fluid breathing, underwater salvage operations, naval procedures, things like that. And so he thought I might be a good candidate, and that's how I started with Jim. And Isn't it amazing? And just him, how you so. how the the connections, the 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 camaraderie, the 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 serendipity of it all. And what I love about this story, because we, we you hear so many stories about Jim Cameron and what he's like as a director, as a as a person, but you this this tale, Van, gives us a, a real insight into into the human side of him and what what made him bond with you. I mean, you bonded over a, a shared passion and you know, a good man. Just really a human side that we don't often get to hear about. We're really grateful to have this story from you. Yeah, he's a really he's a really sharp guy. But he's can also be a really personable guy, especially back then. Because remember, he had only done Terminator, yeah. and Aliens had just come out, and and was a big hit. hit. Uh, as you know, he actually also wrote the screenplay for uh, Rambo: First Blood Part Two. I didn't but, know that. I, I did and, know that and, somewhere back in in the memory and, banks. And uh, and Stallone rewrote it and cut it in half by taking out almost <laughs> all of his dialogue. Oh, well. <laughs> he just wanted to not he didn't want to say too many words in the movie so fair enough but it was more it was uh, you know a different kind of thing uh and it was the on the basis of that and having directed terminator that they gave them first the the gig to write aliens 
And then after Terminator came out, the ability to direct it. So to see him come up through, uh, you know, he was driving school lunches in a truck when he was, you know, uh, starting out. He, I think know, there's something there's something valuable there too. Um, I I came up through the theater. Uh, I was I was actually a musical theater uh, performer mm-hmm. for a very brief time. I was a dancer, and then I sort of retrained as an actress. And we were encouraged to start our own theater company where we were literally sewing the costumes and hanging, you know, hanging the curtains and creating the props and everything ourselves. That sort of analog, hands on, no budget you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches training is is kind of invaluable, I think. And and sometimes the youth of today, Nelson, we like to talk about the youth of today uh, in, in various forms. They think <laughs> there's this there's this straight A to B shot to success or the dream job or, you know, I've done many, many different jobs in this industry that has brought me to being a filmmaker, which actually took a bit too long as far as I was concerned. If I'd been yeah. offered the opportunity in my 30s, I'd have grabbed it. But there weren't any women directing movies in when I was in my 30s. Anyway, get us up to t- to Titanic and explain uh, what your role there was, aside from being uh, the recognizable featured player. Well, there's unfortunately, there's a long story in between that, which is I worked with Jim for eight years. Uh, I worked with him through uh, The Abyss, in which I had like several credits on the show. Um, my favorite James my... Cameron movie just watched it again it's it's mm-hmm. amazing and and just I can link it to Titanic because there's so many moments in it that are like rehearsals for what you see in Titanic like the the, the you know you're underwater you're or the doors going the 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 uh the fantasy and imagination of what goes on deep 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 under the ocean surface I just love the film so much and I, I had a huge crush on Ed Harris as well so thank you it was a it was, it was it was an amazing learning experience as my as my first big feature film where I was on set every day and I was working all the way from from pre-production through post uh, as as his kind of creative assistant, because I had introduced him to computers because I had gotten my first Apple Macintosh the same day I met Jim. <laughs> and and Jim ended up having asking me to get one for him and be his computer consultant in the early years, which is hilarious. Uh, so we worked through the abyss and I was involved in all, a lot of the, not only just the visual effects stuff, but some of the research stuff and the creative stuff and, and so on. And so uh, I got to do something similar on Terminator 2, was on set, did all that kind of things, Uh, was basically the head of his production department at Lightstorm when they formed Lightstorm. And uh, at a certain point, he knew, you know, we had a discussion about what my future was going to be. And he said, you know, I know you're interested in directing, making films. You know, if you want to do that, I only make, you know, a film every three years, you know, so you know, what you really need to do is one of two things. You have to decide, are you going to go into visual effects? In which case, maybe you should go and work for, our, you know, my subsidiary company, Digital Domain, which we just started. And I was involved in the, the, the discussion there. Scott Ross uh, seems to think I came up with the name Digital Domain, but I don't remember it like that. <laughs> but but uh, so he said, Van, you should either consider going to work for DD, you know, for me at DD, or... You need to, if you want to direct, you need to get uh, more onset experience. And so I said, well, I'm going to take a page from what Jim would do, which is do the best of both worlds. And so what I did was I, I went and worked on other shows that used computers on the set. And what it was, was doing screen graphics. So I ended up working on films like Congo and... Dante's Peak and Twister, where having computer screens were one of the characters in the film. I liken that kind of work to basically being the three yellow barrels in Jaws, where where you (laughs) save save showing the shark (laughs) for the moments, A, when it's most dramatic, and B, when the mechanics were working. But in the meantime, you've got to use something to say, oh, it's there now. Oh, it's coming yeah, you know, yeah. to create suspense. And so what we did was we did it through graphics. We had built a we had built a portfolio of doing graphics. And then they started saying, oh, can you do visual effects? I get sure, because I came from a background of visual effects as well. So we started doing visual effects for movies and so on. And in 1997, 
it was 96, 97, we were working on Starship Troopers, Dante's Peak, Spawn, you know, films like that. And I, out of the blue, I get a call from, uh, from Jim. I get a text page while I'm on, on location or on the set for Spawn, which I was not having a good time on. <laughs> and he said, come down to Mexico and be in the movie. I was, you know, odd that he even remembered and thought of me. Uh, I, 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 I joke that he met, I may have been the only Asian person he knew of that age that my Wait, were you a DEI role, but... hire? Were you a DEI hire? <laughs> then? Apparently, apparently. Uh, I, I took a week off, went down to Mexico, where you guys were in the middle of production, and, and saw the amazing stuff. It's like, yep, that's Jim. And, you know, building all this and, and, and everything. And he had invited me to be a part of it. And I was, I was so uh, amazed. And he said, so you're playing, one of the Chinese passenger was found floating on a door and we want to shoot that moment. So we were shooting in the, the, the small tank inside the stage where they were filming with Kate and Leo and everybody in the, in the water. And uh, they did the whole thing with the, with the, the um, putting on the ice crystals and all that kind of stuff. You, you use footage of me from that pod, from the special making of stuff. In, in your film, Ship of Dreams. And uh, so I did that. It was like basically one day, one or two days of just doing that. Um, and went back, went back to work. And a uh, couple months later, Jim calls and says, I want you to come back down here since, you know, we established you in the end, I, you know, with this end scene, we want to establish you earlier in the movie. So come on back down. So I came back in February for another week and you guys are still in the middle of shooting. And we did all the scenes with the walking through the hallways and the scene where they break through the gates. And, and the real Titanic geeks love to remember that you weren't just an actor, but you were this colleague of Jim's and that you had been <laughs> called at the 11th hour and, and put in these scenes. Well, one thing I want to point out, um, my friend who made the bet with me. I brought him along with me when we started The Abyss. His name was Ed Marsh. Oh Your my dad. friend. <laughs> and uh and so yeah, we you know, we worked on a lot of those films and uh, you know, he worked on and off at Lightstorm with us for many years and then after I left, he you know, continued on and and did a lot of these things for Jim and you know, was in the movie as well. Um and you know, we both had cameos in Terminator 2 as well. It was it was a lot of fun doing all he's, these things. He's known for doing that, though, too. I remember sitting at the captain's table and there was this English gentleman who was accent I recognized. And it was Peter Lamont in the in the ship's doctor's costume. I was like, what are yeah. you doing here? He said, I shouldn't be here. I'm the I'm the art director. I should I'm the production designer, excuse me. He said, I I, you know, and I started asking about the carpets and the and the, and the wicker chairs, because of course I was totally fascinated with all that stuff. He says he'd done he'd done a bunch of you know uh gym shows and He's just like, Jim always makes me get dressed up and be in the film. So I guess it's just the thing. You, you know, you don't, you don't. That's an ensemble. Know. That's like a repertory company. And I, yeah. you know, some people, yeah. some people will talk about Hollywood nepotism, but I don't think that's true at all. I think it's a case of you work with the people you know, you like, and you trust. And you're obviously in that circle of knowing, well, liking, trusting. Well, it's kind of, kind of giving people skin in the game as well. It's like, okay. You better do your job well because you're going to be in it. Your face is going to be up there too. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I mean, it's not. I, I'm not. I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's just like you said. We're all putting on a show. I I well, did high. I did high school drama and did all sorts of show building sets and everything else. So I I, I know the that kind of camaraderie. Um, and it's paying it's, it forward. Ultimately, it's paying it forward. Yeah, and if you yeah. don't suck, you'll get invited back. I mean, it's just a fact. I'm constantly, you know, there's there's a couple of. Um, uh, you know, not under any circumstances will I hire that person again. But most people are, you know, in an industry, like I said, which it, it requires all of this passion and focus is is there. That That's what I hope this well, this conversation well, is about is is demonstrating is demonstrating not just the, the training and the and the talent, but the but the willingness and the openness uh, and passion as as well, Nelson. the connections, well, the connections as well. Uh, one of the other people that you know, I I was a friend with, as was Ed, and we brought on to the show as well, was Anders Falk, 
who was a, another schoolmate of mine, um, and and another one who came and joined us from USC through all through this through me through my connection was Steve Quayle. So, so yeah, and, 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 and yeah, full circle, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So circle. we all so we all ended what, up working together. What are you, you know? working on now, Van? Give us a little plug for for yeah. the the your background there, which is apparently um, New Mexico for Greece. We can't trust you. We we can't trust yeah. you to Anything's be where we possible. where you look like you are. <laughs> well, I I do have some more interesting Titanic related stuff if you're interested. But uh, if, if just give if us one more, one more outside. one more Titanic <laughs> anecdote because because I know our listeners will be gripped. Well, the very first time uh, I met with Jim and we were talking about this stuff and he he, he was talking about we because we were doing the abyss so it was going to be underwater and research and stuff. Um. There was a, uh, they had just discovered the Titanic uh, wreck the, the year before. And Jim was saying, do you, do you know of anybody, you know, that's, you know, with Woods Hole or anything, I think. And, and I said, well, my mom and my dad both went to MIT. And as alums, I know on the calendar, there is a, uh, there was a seminar here in El Segundo, California for, with Dana Yorger, who was. The, one of the mechanical engineers who designed the Jason ROV that you know went down Titanic the same way that uh, the ones in the Abyss and the ones in Titanic uh, were done the remotely operated vehicles and Jim said hey do you think you think you can get me into that seminar so it was me and my mom and Jim going into the seminar where it was I think one of the first times he had direct contact with somebody who you know was on the Titanic expedition. And I wonder if there was any kind of, you know, thought process that, you know, came out of that, which resulted in- uh, I've know, heard that a, he actually, yes, he was a, a Titanic historian and enthusiast and he wanted to make that film. Mm -hmm. One of the other driving forces was that he wanted to have the budget to go down to the wreck and film it with those ROVs because that was, he, he knew he had to do the present day version and, and that got him down to the wreck. So then and I would with think, your mom. Yeah. With yeah, your I mom. would think you, you, you started out our conversation today telling us about the Thursday night series with filmmakers when you were in school. And to me, uh, I feel like you're our guest at one of those Thursday night sessions, you you are you're a natural storyteller. You're a natural teacher, uh, and you you and and leader. And we're 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 all the better for it. There's so well, much more we could be talking about with you know the 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 Chinese sailors who we've actually explored that story mm -hmm. here with Stephen Schweiker yep. made this. yes. Um, I heard that. I, I, did, yeah. I did make the connection that yes, you are in Ship of Dreams Titanic movie dives because that's that wee clip of you getting your yep. icicles, your icicles well, what's, done. Well, what's in, what's interesting is how how many how many layers down this goes is I became Jim's uh, Laserdisc DVD guy or Laserdisc back when we were doing this stuff, and then DVD. I did how many special edition versions of. I produced the special edition of the Abyss for him, the actual film version. The extras, I, uh, yeah, the extra bits. Uh, and, and all the extra bits, but also the special edition version, the long version of the movie, as I also did for Terminator 2, before I had gone off on my own. And so I had all this experience doing those kind of things. So after Titanic came out and we did the film and, and all of this, and it became the hit it was, and they were going to do the first DVD collector's edition for titanic they called me of to course. do that of and course. so ed was ed was working on it and do shooting interviews with all these folks they brought me in as the special edition producer and we created all of these uh you know i created all those pods of those little video clips yes uh, we edit, edited all those uh i did all the visual effects uh casey and i uh our our little company uh at that point, it was Ranchworks. We did all the visual effects, 92 shots for the uh, for the deleted scenes because they needed visual effects as well. Yes. And uh, that's in addition to the 52 shots we ended up doing on the original film, um, which was hilarious because we were the small company and we were like number five in the credits uh, out of four, like 18 effects houses that worked on it. So we were so proud. To, to yeah, work and on as it, you should you know? be, as you should be. What a legacy, Van! Thank you so much. I think we, if 
when we do season three, you have to come back for it like a, a do over and, and fill in some of this stuff. Cause I know I'm sure there are just so many more stories that we don't have time for, but thank where, do we find you so much. Where, do, where do we find you? Where do we keep up with you? I'm ensconced in, in writing. Uh, I did, I did a, my first, my first feature film as a director uh, is, is its own historical tragic uh, romance. Um, it, it was called Cliffs of Freedom. And it's a, uh, it's a historical uh, uh, romance drama that uh, is, uh, is available, I think on Amazon. And, and other places Fantastic. so if you're interested you can yes. check it out um and uh and i actually uh and billy zane's in it oh. I, I uh you know so we got to talk about the titanic days degrees of separation a, degrees Fantastic. of separation exactly well, van yeah, i'm gonna have yeah. a halloween party this year and i'm inviting you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Fantastic. We're so grateful, man. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film Limited. To celebrate Season 2 of Titanic Talk, we've launched a line of Titanic Talk merch. A cap, a mug, a tote, a t-shirt or a hoodie? You'll be sure to find a unique gift for the Titaniac in your life. Look for the link in the notes and on Instagram or go to bit.ly forward slash Titanic Talk shop.